Welcome to the Medical Center Hour uh, for today. Um, I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. I'm delighted to welcome all of you here in this room and other rooms. Um, you know, this may be a little inconvenient for many of you, but from our standpoint, this is a problem to have. Um, that that we have we have brought someone here today with a message and an opportunity um, to share with all of us. Um, and it's gratifying to see how many people have turned out for what is also an important interprofessional opportunity. Um, we are happily sharing this Medical Center Hour uh, with the School of Nursing on the occasion of their annual BICE Memorial Lecture. It's my pleasure to be partnering with the nursing school on this program that has at its heart the compassionate heart of both the nursing and medical professions. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dory Fontaine, the Sadie Heath Cabinist Professor and Dean of Nursing. Dean Fontaine will say a few words about the BICE lecture and then introduce our guest speaker and our program moderate, moderator, whose conversation uh, we will share in for this hour. Here, I must quickly attend to some business and say that neither speaker had any conflicts of interest to declare regarding healthcare goods and services. Um, we also wouldn't be having this program, of course, had young neurosurgeon Paul Kalanithi not written his remarkable, lucid, and beautiful memoir, When Breath Becomes Air, which was published in 2016 after his death. This is just to let you know that the UVA bookstore is here outside uh, the upstairs entrance with copies of When Breath Becomes Air. There will be a book signing immediately following the program during the reception, which is also in the upstairs lobby. Uh, so yes, there is a reception. And yes, you're all most welcome. Uh, Dory Fontaine. So thank you, Marcia, my um, partner in crime here, bringing you this uh, extraordinary program today. I'm so happy to see everybody. I would like to just share with you that the lecture is named for a beloved former UVA nursing dean, you know, 40 or more years ago, Zula Mae Baberbeis. And she passed away of breast cancer, and her husband, Professor Raymond Beis, who taught here for years, endowed this lectureship in her honor. So each year, the BICE provides a platform for inspiring thought leaders to speak about important issues that really matter to nursing and medicine. And I think um, clearly they matter to all of you that are here today. Today's topic stretches beyond the borders of nursing and medicine, even transcending healthcare. The stories we'll hear are for every human everywhere. So I'd like to introduce to you our moderator for today before I introduce Dr. Lucy Kalanithi. I asked Dr. Ken White, who's our Associate Dean for Strategic Partnerships and Innovation to moderate today's panel because he practices and teaches palliative care and end of life care and because he has a compelling vision for how we ought to be treating um, those who are facing life-limiting illness. He is an acute care nurse practitioner. Every Tuesday, he's over there with Dr. Tim Short and our wonderful team offering his expertise. I love listening to his stories at the end of the day. No HIPAA violations, but he does share um, on Tuesday night with me all the wonderful people that he's taken care of. So thank you, Ken, for doing this. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Lucy Kalanithi, but it seems to me that, you know, hundreds of you already know her, which is nice. She is a physician, a professor, a writer, and speaker, a mother, and a widow. She was married for nine years to Dr. Paul Kalanithi, a young neurosurgeon diagnosed with lung cancer, an illness that would claim his life in 2015. He wrote his book while he struggled and suffered and loved, and it really seems to be a bit of a love story and all about courage as well. So the Kalanithis didn't ask for this work. It was thrust upon them by odds in a chaotic universe, 
but their perspectives teach us that in the face of change and uncertainty and even death, there is too profound meaning of profound ability to discover what truly matters. She attended Yale School of Medicine, did her residency training at UCSF, where we actually were there together at two years, but we didn't know each other. Um, she completed a postdoc at Stanford's Clinical Excellence Research Center, and today she teaches medicine at Stanford Medical School. She's a fellow of the American College of Physicians and on its board, and has received many honors about patient-centered and oncology care. So it's my pleasure to welcome you both here today, and we are going to see a short two-minute video, and then we're going to have the moderated discussion. Thank you again for being here. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's such a powerful video with a strong message that resonates deeply especially to this audience of interprofessional clinicians and our students, our learners. If only we could all learn to make the most of our time and live every day to the fullest of the moment, just as Paul did. I'm struck by all the beautiful video footage and mm -hmm. photography about your journey together how is it that you had the forethought to gather such incredible footage, huh. which now, two and a half, three years on, must be a great comfort in your grief? I feel a man <laughs> reaching for my <laughs> coat. I thought it was on. I'm sorry. Um, how is it that you were able to put together this great footage um, as a forethought for this incredible journey? And what a wonderful gift to your daughter, Katie. Um, how, does, um, how does that comfort her and you mm -hmm. at this point? Um, you know, the video for this sort of just came out of luck because Paul had done a little bit of writing and wrote a couple of essays that sort of went viral during the time of his illness. Um, and Stanford made this video. Um, and I feel really lucky for it because they actually did like an hour long interview with Paul and some of it is excerpted there. And I think Katie could watch it later. And I had a sense at the time, you know, he had terminal cancer, I had a sense like, oh, I'm really happy this video is getting done. And the videographer missed his own Thanksgiving to come to our Thanksgiving, the last Thanksgiving mm -hmm. that Paul was there for. Mm -hmm. um, but just kind of like a lot of things, I think it was sort of luck. Um, you know, and the goodness of other people sort of paying attention, um, which is sort of how the book came about too. And um, yeah, I was lucky. And, and um, you know, Katie is now four, our daughter. Um, she was eight months old when Paul died, so she won't have her own memory of Paul. And he didn't write her a series of other letters or anything else, like the book that he wrote was a letter to her too. And so um, I think a lot about how to, help her develop a relationship with Paul or the idea of Paul. Mm -hmm. She's sort of growing up into that, so this will be part of it. What a beautiful gift yeah. to her and, yeah. and to all of your family. In the prologue to the book, When Breath Becomes Air, Paul describes the transformation from doctor to patient. I call him Paul because I've read the book now three times and he feels like <laughs> a friend. Um, he had to put on a hospital gown and he had to go from um, being a neurosurgeon to lying down in the same room where he had treated hundreds of patients. Tell us about the day of, of his diagnosis and oh, what sure. that was like. Sure. Um, so as some of you know, Paul was a chief resident in neurosurgery at Stanford um, when he started to develop some ominous symptoms and over the course of a few months lost about 15 pounds and um, developed really severe back pain and then ultimately a cough. Um, but he had lost 15 pounds as an intern. I gained 15 pounds as an intern. <laughs> he had lost 15 pounds as an intern. Um, you know, so for a while, we sort of were like, you know, you're standing in the OR for 14 hours a day. Maybe your back pain's from that. And ultimately, sort of sought a workup slowly but surely, and then um, had a chest x-ray that showed nodules throughout the x-ray. And 
Um, I remember that day we were like, maybe it's disseminated tuberculosis. <laughs> like, wouldn't that be so great? You know you're having like a bad day when you're thinking that. And um, packed up to go to the hospital for expedited workup. Um, and we both sort of had the sense, this is probably really bad news. This is probably metastatic cancer. Um, and we didn't know what kind. And one interesting thing that happened that day was um, as we were packing to go to the hospital, I was packing like phone chargers and the insurance card and like socks and just like what you would need for to be comfortable in the hospital, a pillow um, or a blanket. And Paul actually packed a stack of books. Um, he packed um, Being in Time by Heidegger, uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, and a novel called Cancer Ward um, by the Russian author Solzhenitsyn. And, um, that was really interesting. I don't even think he opened them while he was in the hospital, but he sort of had this little stack of books there, and I think it was an early acknowledgement that um, it wasn't medical knowledge necessarily that would help him most through that time. Um, and meanwhile, he hadn't really read a good book in like seven years because he was a neurosurgery resident. He'd read surgical atlases and textbooks, but that was a really interesting thing to notice. And then um, he writes in the book, you know, I put on the hospital gown, I lay down in the patient bed, um, and the future I had imagined evaporated. And I think that was one of the most interesting or striking things about that day that I think coming face to face with your own mortality is, you know, maybe the biggest challenge that we all face. But at the same time, I hadn't quite realized how much um, a serious illness in a moment can shift your identity or take away your identity. I think you, I sort of came to realize how much of our identities are tied up in our future selves and who we imagine that we're becoming, whether it's seeking an education or having a child or you know all the different things that we strive for. I think when that is erased, in a way a part of you is erased and you have to rebuild yourself. And so I, that was what a lot of Paul's writing was about, but it was really striking. Um, and then Paul writes in the book, too, about how you know, we were both in his hospital bed on that day, like trying to get our heads around what happened. And, sort of, um, and he said, I just want you to know I want you to get remarried after I die, it, within like an hour of being diagnosed. And I, it was so striking. It was sort of like, that's not what you want to hear from your spouse um, at all. And, um, but at the same time, it was this really nice acknowledgment of like, I'm thinking about how this is going to affect you, and um, I'm willing to say out loud what's probably going to happen. Um, and I just, it really sort of set the tone for our communication during that time. And then I also just think it's like such a nice version of love, you know, like to love somebody independent of you, and even thinking about them in a world where you won't even be, and still loving them through that. And it, um, it's just a really, I think about that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it was um, it was so intense. From the video and, and from the story you just told and from the book, it sounds like you were surrounded by love in lots of ways. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know about the stack of books, uh, but mm -hmm. that's a perfect segue to my next question. Uh, Paul had, um, if you've read the book, and I suspect most of you have, you know he had a baccalaureate and master's degrees in English literature from Stanford. You commented in the epilogue that Paul had emailed a friend to tell him he had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. He said to the friend, the good news is I've already outlived two Brontes, Keats and Stephen Crane. The bad news is that I haven't written anything. Writing this book brought much joy to Paul. The book is so beautifully written, and it flows in a way that I couldn't wait to savor the next word. It also references great lessons he had learned from his favorite writers. So here's my question. Was Paul a neurosurgeon who became a writer, or a writer who became a neurosurgeon? And how did that transition come about, and how did he conceive of the relationship between literature, the humanities, and medicine? Yeah, um, uh, so I would say a writer who became a neurosurgeon. 
Um, and that's interesting, right, that like when he gets diagnosed with cancer, one of the great losses is that he hasn't written anything, because that was sort of a distant dream of his. And um, initially, he had never thought he'd become a doctor. He studied um, history and philosophy of science and medicine and English literature. Um, and was very interested in thinking about meaning and identity. He was really fascinated by the brain as an organ and thinking about mind-brain um, connection and then um, sort of mortality as like an interesting intellectual and philosophical thing to get your head around. And then ultimately realized that he sort of wanted to be on the front lines of seeing real people, including himself, grapple with um, certainly bioethical questions, but just sort of big questions about um, what does it mean to be human and what does it mean to suffer? And he was really interested in what it means to be, to live inside a fragile mortal body and how you make sense of your relationship with the world through your body um, and your own fragility. And um, I think he really felt like all of these um, academic and intellectual domains, you know, literature and philosophy and the humanities and medicine, um, all were sort of ways to seek the question of what does it mean to be a human being and live a meaningful life. And, um, um, and I think that's true. I think for all of us, um, whether or not we're schooled in the humanities, et cetera, I think we all certainly come across bioethics, you know, when we're in our work and come up against a question like um, whether to withdraw life support on a patient that we're treating. And, um, or the many questions that we come up against every day. So anyway, I think that's where he was trying to enter and why he became a physician. Um, when we first got engaged, he was gonna be a psychiatrist um, and then was one of those people who falls in love with the OR. And I was like, you're gonna be a what? <laughs> and I was like, really? Because <laughs> he was this calm, funny guy. And I was like, wow. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> and, um, uh, and then ultimately, he had to face some of these big questions himself, um, especially mortality, earlier than expected. But um, uh, I think a writer who became a neurosurgeon. And then it was after he died, you know, I was, you get to choose the writing that you put on somebody's headstone. And it says, Paul Kalanithi, neurosurgeon and writer. And it felt a little gutsy to put writer, actually, because he had this book that he had written. And I was working with the editor on the manuscript, but it hadn't been published yet. And now I think of Katie will like look back and see like my dad was a writer, like maybe even foremost. Um, so that's sort of interesting. And it felt, I was like, I'm gonna put writer. Doesn't matter what happened with his book. Like that's what he was, you know? Um, but anyway, yeah. We're all so many things other than physician, yeah. nurse, social worker. And um, yeah. I think that's an important distinction that we are so much more than what we do um, sure. in our professional world. Sure. What were some of your most important insights um, when Paul was a, a patient, through the eyes of a patient? Um, as we go through our training uh, to take care of our patients, we don't generally experience the role of a patient until we're much older, if we do at that point. So how did Paul's experience as a patient change your perspective about caring for patients? Yeah. Um in some ways it really did, and in some ways it didn't, um, or deepened things that I had hoped for already. Um, I guess I have a couple answers to this question. There's one moment that really stands out to me, actually, as like a moment of internal conflict for me, where um, for people who have read the book, there was a time where Paul was hospitalized with complications of chemo, and the um, admitting resident left one of his oral chemotherapy medications off the inpatient med list because his LFTs were elevated, and Paul sort of got in this discussion with him and said, you know, it's been like that for months, and I actually get really bad bony pain when I'm in withdrawal if I skip doses of this medication. Um, so please, can you keep it going? And um, it was this really spiky interaction, because ultimately the resident said, if you weren't you, I'd make you prove that you had all this pain. It's like, whoa. And, um, and now, looking back, I think about this poor guy who probably himself was like burned out and having a really hard time, maybe, and now is like immortalized in the pages of this book as like yeah. <laughs> having like been in this. And it's like I've probably been that resident too, you know, um, maybe. And uh, 
So the medication ended up going on the med list the next day, but not overnight. And I actually had it in my purse in this little prescription bottle that we carried around that also had like naproxen and Valium and opioid. We were like, this is probably worth like $200 if you were like in a cell. <laughs> or more. We, we called it the fun kit, but it's like we were like managing his medications all the time and like talking about how to time the Zofran doses. You know, it's like it was a lot of, it's a lot of medication management that we were both kind of doing and I had it in my purse. And so he ended up taking it out of my purse, which he doesn't write in the book actually. I don't know why, but um, he ended up taking it and at the moment, I was like, this is actually, you know, if I were the inpatient team student or resident or attending, I'd be like, this is a patient safety issue. You know, this patient took his home med out of his, out of his wife's purse, and um, this is not how it's done. And I, would, I might even feel, like, personally affronted or something. But on the other side, I was like, you know what? Like, when you're the patient and family, it's like, it's your body, and you are doing what you need to do in accordance with what you feel like makes sense for you and your own understanding of the risks and benefits. And I, I just remember thinking like of my own hubris in that situation and like really, um, I don't know, I've thought about that moment a lot. Um, and I think I used to, you know, like think, I'm doing a really great job like including the patient in the plan of care. And now I'm like, oh, the patient is the plan of care. Like I'm the one who's like, hopefully being included in that, you know? And so um, that was a really sort of pivotal moment for me. And then um, I think about family caregivers a lot, of course. You know, like I walk into the patient's room now and I see the other family member sitting there who often is a spouse or an adult child and there's 40 million of those people who are taking care of somebody in their family. Um, and um, they say the best long-term care insurance in America is a conscientious adult daughter. And <laughs> just like, true. And my Aunt Candy is here, and I'm like, she has two of those. And, um, and I think also, you know, as far as like caregiver and family leave policy, like the best family leave policy is a really nice boss who's willing to break the rules. And I think, um, so I think about that a lot. Um, and for our family, you know, my boss let me do my postdoc work at home. And Paul's boss, the GME at Stanford, kept him on the health insurance roll, even when he became disabled. And we had so much luck in terms of supportive systems like that. So I think a lot about policy for supporting family caregivers and the National Alliance on Caregiving or the um, you know, patient and family partnership organizations and all that kind of stuff. So um, there's that, too. Um, I guess I could tell a lot of stories. But um, the, the one other thing I'll say is, Whenever I'm seeing a patient, I have always tried to do this, but I think right now I see patients in urgent care, and I, I always sort of think about, like, what is the patient hoping for and fearing, even in something as simple as you come in and you have an upper respiratory infection and you're convinced that you need a Z-Pak, and that's, like, the classic, like, one of the frustrating dilemmas in outpatient urgent care. It's, like, not everybody, most people don't need a Z-Pak. Many people think they do, and now I'm, like, what is it that you're hoping for with the antibiotic? And often it's like, I'm giving a presentation at work tomorrow and I really have to be on my game or my sister had terrible pneumonia and nobody caught it and now I'm really scared that that's me and, or I'm going on an airplane or just whatever. And I think oftentimes it's like, oh, there's many ways we can actually attack that and the antibiotic isn't the way to do it. So let's talk about that. And so I think, you know, my practice has been influenced a lot um, and my own empathy and connection to patients, depending on who it is, is deeper or different. Um, mm. And then in some ways it's not, you know, it's like mm. I think, I don't think you have to be a patient to be able to develop deep empathy and compassion, or at the very least, like skills that you can use every time uh, to connect to people. It strikes me that you described this individual compassion that you have now. Um, maybe you had, it, you had it before, but you have it now in a different way. But you also mentioned organizational compassion or institutional yeah. compassion. The leaves where they like sort of stretch the rules a little mm -hmm. bit. And you know, that's, um, that's a growing concern and something we hear um, under Dean Fontaine's leadership um, are spending a lot of time on. And that's a nice segue to my next question. 
Your husband talked about the pain of failure that he felt for his patients and about one of his dear friends, a surgeon who died of suicide. Tell us about the experience of being a physician and the risks of clinician burnout. And a follow-up, have you thought of any solutions? Mm. Um, I have a lot to say about this. Um, I'm really interested in burnout because I think it's one of the places where the business case for improvement meets the moral case. And um, because there literally is a business case for reducing clinician burnout, and it's a cause of you know, lower patient satisfaction and quality and safety, and I think we should study it and report it just like any other um, you know, cause of deficit in our care. Um, and so there's been studies that show that medical students start out with higher resilience and quality of life than their peers, age-matched peers, and it takes so much grit to get to medical school and get to the health professions. And I think, um, I guess I think sort of burnout comes from two different places, right? There's personal resilience and then there's system factors. And I think the system factors are really big and important. Um, some of that is cultural. Um, there was just a surgical resident who wrote an essay in the New England Journal. I just tweeted it if it, you want to read it. It's really good and it's talking about um, the physical um, arduousness of um, medical training and how her resident at one point says, it's okay to take a day off if when you come back you can tell me what the ventilator settings were on you. It's like, whoa, that's like, you know, it's like really intense. And, um, and I think, you know, when burnout has been studied, there, the system factors that matter are things like um, loss of autonomy and flexibility or unrealistic workload. Um, or lack of meaningful tasks or professional connection um, and social support. And I think um, uh, the solutions also come out of that. And I think studying burnout, naming it, measuring it, and then adapting local solutions that have more autonomy and flexibility for clinicians and realistic workload and all those kinds of things um, really matter. And I think, um, you know, over the past 10 years or 15 years or however long, Burnout has become a thing that we're recognizing. And I think initially it was really focused on professional wellness and resilience. And um, I heard this great phrase in someone talking about burnout, which was, if there's a canary in the coal mine, you can't just teach the canary to meditate. And I think that's really important that the, the you know, if you feel burned out or anxious or depressed, it's not that there's something wrong with you. You may be a very well-adjusted human being reacting perfectly logically to a really intense system that's not built very well for human beings always. So, um, and I had an episode of depression in residency um, that taught me a lot and actually some of the coping skills I brought out of that helped me during Paul's illness in ways that I wouldn't have expected. But um, if you had told me 10 years ago that I would be at UVA giving an important lecture saying that I had had a episode of depression, I would never believe it, you know? So I think just talking about this up here is new and different for you to be asking about it and for you, your leadership on it. So um, uh, anyway, and I think the fact that the AAMC, which oversees medical schools um, and the other training programs recognizing it is a big deal. Um, yeah, so I really care about burnout a lot and have experienced it, and Paul obviously experienced it. So. Um, yeah, I think that the main thing to think about, to recognize it as a system issue, um, both in scope and in um, contributing factors is, a, is important. Mm. Thanks for your vulnerability and authenticity in mm -hmm. saying that. In talking with patients, our patients, your patients, uh, all of our patients, how do you balance honesty and hope? That mm -hmm. comes up quite often. Were there good role models um, for how Paul's physicians handled this, or could it have been done better? Yeah. Um, so for people who've read the book, you can see that Paul's oncologist essentially refused to talk about prognosis, which I actually thought was kind of crazy at the time. And um, she actually did at two different points that he also didn't write about. One was um, with family members all along to 
get everybody on the same page that it wasn't a curable illness as things stand now. And then also at the very end when Paul had brain mets and leptomeningeal disease, she was really straightforward in saying, even if we can treat this, we probably have a few weeks to a few months, um, which was intense to hear from her, especially because she hadn't um, prognosticated explicitly before. Um, but I like one thing that Paul said in the book, which is, it's irresponsible to be more precise than you can be accurate. And so what we were both trained in, and which I agree with, is to think about prognosis in terms of a likely range. You know, Oftentimes you can say, for this particular patient, I expect hours to days, or days to weeks, or weeks to months, or years. And oftentimes that's enough to decide if you want to keep working as a neurosurgeon, or how to think about having a baby. Um, or whatever, you know, and I think um, another thing Paul writes about in the book is, this is paraphrasing it a little, but it's something like, you know, the when you're grappling with existential distress, turning to medical knowledge and statistics is like trying to quench a thirst with salty water. And I think that's true. I think oftentimes when people are asking, how long have I got left, the underlying question is something like, who am I still? And what can I still have? And I think exploring that question of what you're hoping for and who you are and what you're hoping to still do in your life and then try to facilitate that um, might be more important. Um, and then I learned something too, which was um, I sort of couldn't believe that she wasn't addressing prognosis. But then she knew that we could find it out and we knew the statistics applied to us. Um, which many patients don't. There are studies that about two-thirds of patients with metastatic cancer think that cure is possible for them in their current treatment. Um, but she knew that we didn't think that. And I think she really brought Paul back to life. I think she recognized that. Um, I don't know. I think she brought Paul back to life in a way that I didn't expect. And I think um, I really love her for that. And I think he loved her for that, mm. too. Thank you for that. And I think uh, some of the things that you said earlier uh, regarding hope mm -hmm. is that some of, um, correct, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but uh, some of the hope was sort of redefined in the hope for the book mm -hmm. and the hope for, for Katie and the hope totally. for leaving um, things behind. Totally. So, I think um, hope is not just a one track thing. I agree. I think there's many things you can hope for. And people do hope for many things. Absolutely. The work that all of us do and your experience with Paul and Katie is uh, deeply connected to memory, location, and context. In your epilogue, you stated that Paul died on March 9th, 2015, in a hospital bed on the same floor, about 200 yards from where Katie came into the world in the late labor and delivery suite. This is a powerful context. As Katie grows up, how will you help her remember Paul? Um, I think about this a lot. If anybody is in this situation, um, developing a relationship with somebody who's not here anymore, I'd love to know um, your experience and advice. Um, so, so far there's been a couple things. Obviously there's this book that Katie left for, that Paul left for Katie. Um, she's not old enough to know about it. She kind of knows what it is, sort of. She can recognize it. Um, but I made her a picture book about Paul. She's like super aware of Elmo and Peppa Pig and Curious George. It's like she understands these characters very well. And so I made her a book with pictures of Paul and kind of a story about Paul and family pictures and pictures of his grave site. Um, and obviously, she doesn't know what a grave is, but she'll sort of grow up into knowing that. and. Um, and I also want to make sure that he doesn't, he's not sort of like canonized in a way that he's too perfect or unattainable or something because he wasn't. And I don't even think that's fair to him, let alone fair to her. And so I try to think about that, like how do I keep him a normal person? Um, and then I also think, you know, um, it's just interesting to see how kids sort of reacts to this context where. Um, she does understand that she has a dad, but he's not here. And the other day, she found a little um, party favor from our wedding, which is this little Indian bell that we gave out. And 
I was like, oh, you know what that is? That's for my wedding to daddy. And she said, oh, was I at the wedding? And <laughs> I'm so like self-centered, you know, and I was like, I was like, no, you weren't even born yet. You weren't even born yet. And she goes, oh, that's because I was dead. And I was like, <laughs> like, oh wow! And so it's just like really interesting to raise a kid. And it's like I feel like she's teaching me too, or like telling me, you know, I, I don't know. Um, and then I have found child life services and social workers to be super helpful in this context because there's certain language that is being studied that kids can handle. So I was told to say his body stopped working, which sounds scary and weird to me, but I think it's like makes it possible for children to get it, and she doesn't seem scared by that. Um, so that was really helpful too, that mm. team. The book, in the book, um, and in your epilogue, and what you've done since the book was published, you've been an advocate for better end-of-life care. Um, earlier um, discussions, and even my passion, mm -hmm. advanced directives. Mm -hmm. So you've said that um, an advanced directive is an act of love. What do you mean by that, and uh, how do you hope our health system will change? Oh, yeah. Um, I love advanced directives or your passion. I'm like, oh, that's good. Work, Tim Short, work. too. It's so great. Um, yeah, so advanced directives. I mean, basically, an advanced directive, as you know, is a legal document that came out of the patient autonomy movement where the Supreme Court decided that you could, you had the right to refuse medical care, which is like, sort of like, duh, but it's like, it's your right as a patient. And then advanced directives give somebody else the right to refuse medical care on your behalf. So it's sort of like a checkbox, yes or no document in a legal sense in most cases. Sometimes it's more detailed. But I think in it is a really soulful thing, which is you trust somebody else to speak for you, and you trust that they know what's important to you in your life and that they will be um, committed and devoted to you and who you are. Um, and I think, to me, the more important thing than just the legal paperwork is somebody who just knows you really well and knows what's important to you. And I think Atul Gawande in the book Being Mortal really does a good job explaining you know, um, how different types of medical care really fit people differently. And people could choose a whole range of um, types of care, intensities of care, um, or goals of care. And um, anyway, I think, I think now I go to weddings, and when they talk about in sickness and in health, till death do us part, that part is the rom really romantic part to me of like all the things that you will go through with your family and with your partner. Um, and I think that this is one of them. And so I think that document seems really dry and black and white, but I actually think it's really soulful. Um, and in some ways really romantic, you know, um, to be in that role. Mm, thank you. I was uh, happy to know that Paul, one of his favorite writers was uh, uh, Susan Sontag. And one of my favorite books was one of his favorite books, Illness as Metaphor. And Susan Sontag wrote, illness is the night side of life, a more onerous citizenship. Everyone who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. Although we all prefer to use only the good passport, sooner or later, each of us is obliged, at least for a spell, to identify ourselves as citizens of that other place. And in Stanford's obituary for Paul, one of his friends said, his dual citizenship as a doctor and as a seriously ill patient, had taught him that respectful communication is the bedrock of all medicine. Referencing the soft skills of medicine that are hard skills to teach and learn. So what can you share with us to help us equip ourselves to improve those soft skills in caring for our patients? Yeah. Um. And Paul referenced that text at one point and said he'd been there many times on a tourist visa as a, <laughs> as a physician. Um, and then he got his own passport. Um, yeah, so um, one of, there's a moment that I really remember and think about, you know, with reference to communication skills and soft mm -hmm. skills where um, 
Paul's targeted chemotherapy first-line treatment stopped working after about 11 months. And um, at that point, he had his last day as a surgeon and was going to need to um, switch to doing um, more arduous chemotherapy. Um, and that's like a new devastation when your cancer progresses and you're adjusting to an, another change. And we, he looked at his own scan, but then we went to see the nurse practitioner in oncology who was amazing. Um, and she said the nicest thing, she looked him right in the eye and she said, I really wanted you to be the guy who's on Tarsiva for seven years and you're not that guy and I'm so sorry. And she like really looked at him and really was sort of immersed in the experience. And I just remember the way that she said it and how allied she felt with us. And I think as a patient and as Paul's wife, we felt really vulnerable and we felt like people acknowledging the situation that we were in and then, you know, um, the words that people used, it's like I came to realize like when you go see the, the provider and you're in the waiting room for an hour and then in the room and you've been waiting a couple weeks for the appointment and then you and your spouse are going to go home and like parse every single thing that they said, it was just the words really mattered and the way they were said really mattered. And, um, you know, there are all these studies that patient adherence to medication is higher when they feel allied with you or there's this great study out of Stanford where a histamine-mediated rash went away sooner if the clinician had reassured the patient that it would, and the clinician was trustworthy and mm -hmm. um, empathetic, and they like had actor clinicians, like one of them was not empathetic, and one of them was like not looking at the patient and sort of disheveled, and like they did. It was like really interesting how like you are the medicine, um, and I just think that's really interesting, and I think also in that vein, you know, you do these teachings about how to communicate or how to communicate empathy. Um, and we think of those as soft skills. But this is another thing that Atul Gawande wrote in um, Being Mortal, where he went to shadow Susan Block, who's a palliative care doctor. And he ended up saying, you know, um, she's not winging it. She has a whole sort of procedure about how to run a family meeting or how to run a code discussion. And it's just as technical and skillful as a, any other procedure in medicine. And I really think that's true. And I think those trainings are, um, you know, skills that really bear on um, not just patient satisfaction ratings and that kind of thing, which are important, um, or how likely you are to get sued, which is also important, but um, the, the quality of your patient's care and how they actually do medically. Um, yeah, so I think about that a lot. And I think, um, uh, I, I, yeah, I, it mattered. It does mm -hmm. matter. With your career now focused on healthcare value, you've asked these questions. What are we getting for our money in healthcare? Are we getting what we aspire to get? And what are your thoughts about that? Mm -hmm. Have you arrived at any conclusions? Or just more questions? <laughs> um, yeah, so prior to Paul getting sick, I was sort of headed in the direction of um, thinking about healthcare value from a cost perspective, um, you know, and like what proportion of GDP we spend on healthcare and are we getting what we want for that? And um, I don't know quite where to start, but I'll just tell you two quick stories that make me think about healthcare value. One is um, all the things we do that are not measured that are really valuable um, that matter. Um, when I was pregnant, I was 38 weeks pregnant, and Paul was a patient in the ICU with chemo complications again. And I only found out later that the ICU critical care nurses and the L&D nurses had a whole plan for what would happen if I went into labor and became a patient, and then we had a baby who was a patient, and then Paul was over here. Like, can a critically ill patient go to L&D? Can a baby come to the ICU? And I'm like, I love those nurses so much, and nobody's paying them to do that, and nobody's measuring that on their, you know, whatever their advancement or whatever, but I was just like, that is so beautiful, and that's its own measure of value in healthcare. Um, and sort of related to that, um, the University of Pennsylvania did a study where they took Yelp reviews of um, hospital visits and compared them to HCAP scores. And they found that um, something like seven out of the 11 HCAPs measures overlapped and were sort of reported informally when, when they did this qualitative analysis of Yelp reviews. And then there were 12 other domains that were not measured at all in HCAPs that were things like attention to the family caregiver 
or compassion. And I think that's really interesting, like who's defining value um, and defining it from the patient perspective, whatever's valuable to them. Um, and then, like I said before, I think the most interesting places to think about value in healthcare are where the business case for improvement aligns with the moral case for improvement. And so for me, that end of life care is probably the biggest one for me. And then also caregivers and also burnout. So um, I think in many places in healthcare, we are getting great value. And in other places, we're still working on it. And I think listening to our own moral distress, you know, about, I have a lot of moral distress about care fragmentation and feeling like when I let this patient go, I don't know where they're getting picked up and they don't know either. I think when you listen to your own moral distress, you have a really good radar for what you're doing that feels valuable and what you're doing that you wish would could be more valuable, you know? It's it's the time element too. A lot of yeah. times, you yeah. know, a family meeting can can take uh, yeah. an hour or, or, or two hours and and you know, we in the in the palliative care world and, and primary teams um, don't always have yeah, you know totally. that, that kind of t time, but it's it's so valuable. One last question before we turn it over to, to our audience: serious illness um, and uh, and death of a life partner is life shattering, and grief can be unbearable. You said that you expected to feel only empty and heartbroken after Paul died. This is in the epilogue, and that you have discovered a certain peace and comfort in that you are still taking part in the life that Paul and you created together. My question, after Paul died, how did you receive support from mm -hmm. others? What did you find meaningful in expressions of condolence? I think we may all have struggled with how to reach out, what to say, what to do mm -hmm. at times like this. So what advice would you have yeah. for us? Yeah, um, so I'm in a Facebook group called Hot Young Widows Club that is like, <laughs> <laughs> It's totally amazing. It's like, it's amazing. And it's really funny and really helpful if you know anybody who needs it, Hot Young Widows Club. And um, <laughs> the two things that people really don't like to hear are, that I've learned from this group too, are um, it's an, often not helpful to say at least, um, you know, uh, and also uh, everything happens for a reason. I think people, um, those are hard to hear because they think things feel, um, terrible and nonsensical, and those can feel sort of like minimizing. That said, everything everybody said to me, I knew that they were saying it with such good intention that I didn't tend to get offended. But the things that were really helpful were people who were willing to just like show up and sit with me and do whatever I wanted to do, whether it was like watch The Bachelor or talk <laughs> about Paul. And um, one of the best condolence cards I got said, this sucks. I love you, and I was like, "That's really good. Like, that's I like that." <laughs> and um, uh, and then one thing that's been really interesting is, you know, doing a book tour for Paul. I didn't know how that was going to feel. I sort of started initially doing it out of like a sense of duty for Paul, of course, like that I would just do whatever the editor told me would be good for Paul's writing. Um, but I have found it so helpful while grieving just to get to say Paul's name, you know, and like. Paul died a little over three years ago, and I still find it really helpful to talk about him. And I have even fallen in love since Paul died and still feel so connected to Paul and like mm. I want to be talking about Paul. So that has taught me about grief where, you know, just because somebody disappears, your love for them and your relationship with them don't. And um, it makes me think more about asking other people, you know, what was your mom like? Or... What are some of the things you miss most about your cousin? Or you know, like just getting to say their name um, alone is so nice. Hmm. So Lucy, before we uh, go to the audience, um, I want to thank you for sharing yeah, your beautiful totally. story. And um, for me, it's been I, I'm filled with gratitude that I can Thanks. sit here with you in this sacred space and the, the sharing that you um, have given us as a gift today. I do believe, Paul, and you have answered Paul's nagging question, and that is, what makes life meaningful? Mm. Questions? Thank you so much. There, uh, I like the fact that Ken mentioned this as sacred space, because yeah. one thing that impressed me was how time stopped 
mm. for this conversation and how much heart there was in the room. There is in the room right now. So thank you. Thanks. And um, now is the invitation for all of you here to participate with questions and comments. Um, we will. We have a couple of mics, and we will ask um, you to please identify yourself when you ask your question or make your comment, and wait to uh, uh, have a mic brought to you. Hi, um, my name is Elizabeth. I'm a fourth year nursing student, and thank you for sharing your story. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, what advice would you give for other healthcare professionals, or how do you look at patients that? aren't um, allowing their family into that intimacy and the vulnerability of this process of a mm. critical illness like this? And how do you help them see that there can be beauty in allowing that vulnerability? And then kind of a follow-up or part two of that is um, through Paul's writing, did you were you struck by anything that you hadn't noticed was as mm. important to him? So yeah, mm. just kind of those two parts. Yeah. Um, in my experience, um, yeah, it's hard to know exactly the situation where a family member is not letting another person into what they're going through or whatever. I often has, have seen that as um, they're protecting the other person. And I think oftentimes you do carry around this secret fear. Um, you know. And I think I, there's a um, woman who runs a lung cancer foundation um, in California who gives the advice to families where she says, sit at your dinner table, and then everybody go around and say what you're most afraid of, um, which is kind of cool. And it's like, maybe you're most afraid of pain, or maybe you're most afraid of what's going to happen to your family after you're gone, or whatever. You might not even know. And I think just that act is really powerful. Um, uh, and then I also think just understanding that um, people will do a lot for their family, whether it's talk about it or not talk about it or, you know, um, work to get things financially said or whatever. And so oftentimes I think um, framing it as an act of like familial love and service is helpful sometimes. Um, and then some families it might be better for them, you know? So I think it, it's hard to know. Um, and then reading the book, there's not anything specifically that surprised me. Well, I was surprised a little bit that Paul right up front talks about how we had a challenging time in our marriage. and. I was, it's like when you're like a third grader and they teach you how to write an essay and it's like start with a catchy intro and I was like, this is your catchy intro is like our like personal thing and then I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like you know, and then, um, but I think if I were a reader, I'd be like, oh, this person is going to be real and sort of like tell me what is really going on and that's interesting and then I think, um, you know, after Paul died, Random House, the editor said, you know, is there anything you want to take out? Do you want to take that part out? Do you want to take out that you did IVF? Do you want to? And I was like, no, no, let's like, it's Paul's writing, so I want to leave it. But it also has generated some of the best conversations for me, um, which that's sort of been a lesson too. Um, and then I think there's one line in the book about deciding to have Katie and where we're talking. And um, Paul says, I say to Paul, you know, if we have a baby during this time, first of all, it's kind of crazy. And secondly, isn't it going to make this time so much harder for you? And having to say goodbye to a child will make dying more painful. And he says, wouldn't it be great if it did? And I think that he writes about that in the book. But that, that wasn't a surprise to me in the book, but it was a surprise to me in real life. I was like, that sentence, wouldn't it be great if it did, I've carried on and really has helped me in other situations later. And so um, yeah, thanks for asking. Hi, Lucy. I'm up here. My name is Sabrina Swagger, and I'm a second year medical student here at UVA. Um, a lot of what you said about Paul's identity really struck me and how he kind of had to reshape that when he got sick. But I am curious more about your identity, and obviously his story has become so widespread, and everyone knows about it. And you are associated, and you've been wrapped up, and now you're talking about the book everywhere, and this has probably become a huge part of your life. But how do you maintain a sense of identity for you maybe inside and outside of this experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think it has been, I'm trying to figure out how to even answer it. The thing that has been so nice is that I feel like at a time of real personal explosion, um, 
the fact of like being connected to a, a story publicly has meant that I haven't had to like somehow pretend to be something different. Like I wasn't like I wasn't sad and I was just going to get back to work or something. And so I feel like um, it's actually been really helpful to sort of have this as part of my identity as a storyteller. Um, and then I think the fact of being sort of publicly vulnerable, I'm always sort of like trying to figure out where the line is. Like I don't want to overshare, but I also feel like there's so much, um, you know, professional seclusion in the health professions, and we're not sure whether we should hug our patients, and we're not sure how much of ourselves we should share with each other, or, you know, is an episode of depression going to derail your career, and it's the only, you're the only person who's ever faced that, and you don't know because no one says anything. So I think some of this has been really neat for me to feel like I can be my full self, um, too, and I think that even translates back into my clinical practice now where, you know, as you develop more self-confidence and more gravitas in your career, now if I don't know the answer to a question, I'll say, let's look it up on UpToDate together. And I'll like turn the <laughs> thing to the, you know, and it's like now I feel able to do that because I feel, um, you know, um, confident and sort of human at the same time. Um, so yeah, it's been, and at the same time, I guess I'll say, I don't quite know what my identity is. I'm like, do I really fit in academia? I'm about to apply for a promotion, but I'm like, do I, does it fit? And I have to keep giving myself the pep talk about being an imposter. And I feel like, you know, um, I feel like, but I'm also okay with um, uncertainty in a way that I wasn't before. I feel like it is okay to be different selves through your life and your trajectory doesn't have to be totally straight. And if you ask any mentors like how they got to be where they are, oftentimes it's something like winding or you know, they ended up where they are not the way you would have thought. So I feel sort of comfortable with that idea too. So partly it's like, I don't know. <laughs> we have time for one more question. There. Hi, uh, my name is Lindsay. I'm a fourth year English uh, undergrad. Um, so I loved, I loved the way he tied up uh, literature and science. Yeah. I thought it was beautiful. Um, this is a pretty personal question, but also I thank you for everything that you guys have shared with us. Um, there's in the video a little snippet of Katie being baptized, and um, Paul talks for like a couple pages about his beliefs and faith system. And I just, I don't know, was wondering like what role has faith played for you guys in such a like face to face encounter with the idea of death and the idea of existential questions and a lot of people like we enjoy putting off because you know we can or yeah. we convince ourselves that we can so yeah yeah um, thanks for the question thanks for being here too um it's interesting because paul wrote about his faith in the book and people who are like diehard atheists come up to me and say i really relate to the way he talks about that and people who are really faithful christians come up and say i really relate to the way he talked about that <laughs> it's like because he's sort of talking about it as like it's a journey it's a um you know it's messy um so paul definitely would have called him called himself a christian um and at the same time one time in medical school i said you know so do you believe in god and he said i think it's just as important a question to ask do you believe in love it's sort of like there's a lot of unknowable um, that really matters to us. And so I, he kind of distills that in the book, too. Um, uh, but I think he felt that Christianity and um, the depiction of suffering within Christianity actually was like, and Jesus as a model for human suffering was actually really comforting to him. And that was really interesting to see. Um, I am sort of agnostic, and I think at the same time, the structure of the church and the community of the church was so helpful in lots of different ways. Um, uh, in particular, after Paul died and like the rituals after Paul died, everything from like casseroles to a Christian burial, like it was just really, really helpful and comforting. And I think. Um, I might have even said I was an atheist before, and now I'm agnostic, which feels like its own, like, that feels like a real progression in faith to me. Um, uh, but anyway, I think, um, yeah, Paul found it immensely helpful, and at the same time found literature immensely helpful. I think the stories and the, um, 
yeah, just the modeling of meaning and accepting suffering um, were really powerful for him. Yeah, and family too. And actually, I will say too, chaplains and the chaplaincy in the hospital were so powerfully beautiful that someone exists to be there just for that purpose, not medical at all, was really powerful figure for us. Um, and we didn't explicitly call out palliative care, but that was the other team that was remarkably helpful for us. And my one piece of advice I give to families, if they say, what should we be doing? Or maybe even for this family that you were mentioning, I think involving palliative care is the biggest, most helpful thing that I tell people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. We've come to the end of this hour, and I'd like to thank all of you for sharing this time with us, and Lucy Kalanithi and Ken White for such a beautiful and probing and enlightening conversation. Um, we also love it that this has been a very interprofessional audience on this interprofessional occasion and uh, we hope that what has been discussed here and modeled here is carried on into your work. Um, now just a reminder, there are books available outside. There also is food available. Um, and also please join us on Wednesday of this week, just two days away, for our final Medical Center Hour for the fall semester and our final Medical Center Hour in our mini-series on the centenary of the 1918 influenza.